Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us for today's session of New Jersey Be a Civic Leader. We're gonna get started with our content in just a moment as a few of our guests are logging in today. While we're doing so, I do wanna acknowledge that we are recording today's conversation so folks can have a recap of the conversation at a later moment. We'll also give space during today's presentation to have question and answers with today's special guest, Dr. Samuel Wang. So if you do have any questions or comments, please know that you can add them into the Q&A function of your Zoom box, or you can add them onto the chat function of the Zoom platform as well. And we'll acknowledge individuals comments and questions as they come in. So just give us a couple minutes and we'll officially get started. Thanks again for being with us. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. And thank you again for being with us for today's conversation as part of the New Jersey Be a Civic Leader program. My name is Stephanie King, and I'll be joining you as the moderator for today's conversation as we welcome a special guest to today's discussion. As always, this conversation will be recorded so that folks can have a recap of the content and that we do hope that you'll engage with us throughout today's presentation. When we do so, we ask that you type in any questions or comments, either using the Q&A function of Zoom or the chat function of Zoom. Know that we'll respond by either reading your question or comment aloud to the group, or we'll respond to you individually depending upon the nature of the comment or question that's being asked. Exact examples, if you have a tech question, we'll respond individually. If it's a question for the group, we'll make sure to address that with the audience. Um, as we get started today, I do wanna go ahead and introduce you briefly to our special guest, Professor Samuel S. Wang, who is with Princeton University as a neuroscientist. He um, has research interests in neuroscience of sensory learning, development and autism, and data science for neuro neuroscience with public policy and election law. So a jack of all trades, if one might say. He's the author of Welcome to Your Brain of 20, 2008, and then also Welcome to Your Child's Brain in 2011. Before working at Princeton, he conducted research at Duke University. He's part of an initiative at Princeton University called the Electoral Innovation Lab, which focuses on the big picture and three key areas in the democratic process. One of which being fair redistricting, the second being reforming partisan primaries, and the third making the vote process more voter centric for individuals. There are key areas of focus within the electoral innovation lab, some of which are on your screen now, but today what we're going to be focusing on is specifically the gerrymandering project coming out of Princeton University and the electoral innovation lab. The Princeton Gerrymandering Project works within the lab to provide cutting edge data and research tools for partner organizations working nationwide, including state reform, organizations, government, and civic engagement groups and redistricting commissions. And while that's just a brief introduction of the work that is happening that Professor Lang is leading, I wanna give him some space and time to introduce himself further, as well as to guide us through some conversation today regarding Princeton Gerrymandering Project. So Dr. Wang, the floor is yours. Oh, you're still muted, sir. Okay, well, thanks very much for having me. It's uh, great to be with you and uh, great to meet everyone in the, in the pre-show. And I look forward to any uh, good discussions. So um, what I'd like to do today is talk just a little bit about uh, my team here at Princeton, uh, the Electoral Innovation Lab, and what we've been doing to try to use data to uh, what I would say um, I'd say using data and technology and science to repair and, uh, I don't know, some would say perhaps rescue democracy. Uh, I think it's a very challenging time for our democracy, uh, perhaps the most challenging it's been for uh, as long as a century. And so I think it's a good time for any citizen who cares very much about the future of our democracy to get involved. And so what I'm going to do is show you what we're doing <clears throat> and give it a sense for where the state of play is for uh, uh, democracy right now in 2021, with a special focus on something that's happening right now, redistricting, which sets the playing field for democracy for the coming decade. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and I assume that I have sharing capacity and hope that I can get, I always, always, always it's fraught to do sharing of slides, but if you can see my slides now, uh, Stephanie or someone else, let me know if it's coming up okay. Is, uh, can you see my slideshow at the moment? Yeah. 
Right now we're seeing the whole slide deck, not an individual slide show. So there we go. How's that look? That's perfect. Okay. So let me just reduce something. So yeah, so let me talk about this group. It's a, it's a group that works on policy uh, here at the university. Um, it's a group of uh, nine people right now working full time uh, and, uh, and many students who have gotten involved in various ways. And I wanna talk a little bit about the student involvement as well. And I would say that our, our mission is to rescue and repair democracy using science, law and practical strategies for nonpartisan reform. Uh, at the moment we're housed in Green Hall, but we're about to move, we're gonna move uh, to uh, a headquarters out on Alexander Street, like kind of far out from a student point of view. Uh, but a lot of our student facing activities are in conjunction with American studies. We're housed within American studies. And so we have uh, student facing activities over at AMS, uh, whether it be uh, freshman seminars or coursework, or even a software project that I'm gonna to get to towards the end. Uh, so, uh, so this slide, actually, I, I should have changed it from Green Hall, but that, where, we're, where we are right now is Green Hall. So let me talk a little bit to just set the stage about the kind of problems that we face as a democracy. Um, sometimes it's a little bit hard to have a long view of what's happening, but I would say right now we're at, our, at a pretty unusual juncture in the history of American democracy where we have um, a majority that is uh, getting smaller and on the verge of no longer becoming a majority. And that's... Uh, 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 a group that includes some of the people who are at this January 6th insurrection. Um, and we're also at a time when our society is closely divided, where the two major parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, are at a national level right at the 50-50 point. And that 50-50 point means that a lot of the political struggles of today are unusually fraught. And I just want to uh, show you this uh, clipping. This is actually a really excellent article that Timothy Snyder, who studies authoritarianism, and, uh, and fascism and what and moments in history that lead to fascism. He wrote this article just three days after the January 6th insurrection. And in particular, uh, it was interesting to read what he wrote uh, uh, as a motivator for how to think about democracy, where he wrote about how democracy is under threat now because we have gamers, breakers, and a desperate minority. The way I would put it is, uh, gamers would be those who choose to move and manipulate the rules of democracy to gain advantage. And at some level, I would call that normal politics. And then breakers, those who are willing to break democracy uh, in order to get uh, advantage for, for an outcome that they feel is right. Uh, so for instance, if you are part of, say, um, uh, an America that uh, views its best days as being in the 1950s, uh, when uh, your particular demographic was on top, uh, and you were able to get ahead without a college education, uh, perhaps from your point of view, things have gone terribly wrong in the United States. And maybe what you'd like is to restore an America in which uh, that America is great again. Uh, and so if you're in that demographic, that's a, a, a shrinking demographic and you may feel um, that in fact, desperate measures are needed in order to save what you feel is the Republic. And so we saw this come to a head in the January 6th insurrection. And I think uh, it's probably no exaggeration to say that this side of the United States is not going away anytime soon. And we have to be concerned about exactly how, what we can do to strengthen democracy, uh, to, uh, to keep a, a nation that is strong for all its citizens and all its, um, all its factions and, uh, and various communities. So I would argue to you that we're in a second Gilded Age. So if we think about the first Gilded Age, it was an age of racial division, technological disruption, increasing inequality uh, and deep partisanship. And what we're looking at here is that first Gilded Age measured from the standpoint of data. If you look at this gray shaded region here, it indicates the period of that first Gilded Age. And what we're looking at is a graph of data showing what the popular vote margin was of the person who ended up winning the presidential election. And anytime you see a red dot, it means that the popular vote loser became president. When you see a black dot, it means that that person who got more votes also became president. And you can see here that in, during the Gilded Age, there were uh, six elections that were super close. Uh, the margin of victory was within five percentage points in terms of the popular vote. And twice the popular vote loser became president, uh, Benjamin Harrison and Rutherford Hayes. Um, now, if you look over the uh, subsequent hundred years or so since then, elections have not been nearly so close. There have been some close elections, but on average, whether it be Dwight Eisenhower or Franklin Roosevelt or Ronald Reagan, uh, these elections were not particularly close. But if you look over here on the right, we have another period of very close elections. And unfortunately, this is an older version of the slide. I, Donald Trump's recent loss is not on the slide, 
But um, but you can see here there's five, and there's actually one more election here that's not shown here. I want to just draw it in because you know nothing like altering your slides during the presentation. But uh, but Donald Trump's recent loss is right about there. If you can see what I've uh, drawn in with my uh, with my pen. Um, and so we live in a time now of racial divisions, technological disruption, economic inequality, uh, the highest it's been in, in many decades, and again, deep partisanship. And so what I would argue too is that one way to think about a modern age is that it's another gilded age. And in some ways that's uh, somewhat uh, uh, concerning because uh, it was a time when the Republic was under threat of being torn apart back then. We had, you know, one of the few things that kept us together was that we had just come out out of a terrible civil war. Um, but there's also some hope because uh, such periods of close division cannot last forever. And so you can imagine that if we could just keep our democracy strong, repair it, strengthen it, perhaps in just as little as one or two decades, uh, things might be in fact much better in the United States, just as the first Gilded Age gave way to a, a progressive age, one could hope for a new progressive era in our near future in the next few decades. Now, what I want to do right now, let's see, turn off my sketching here. What I want to do now is talk about a particular problem, gerrymandering, which is something that's on our minds and our team right now because redistricting is in full swing. Every 10 years, the political districts of America get redrawn. Um, and this is just a rogues gallery of the kinds of gerrymanders that occurred in the last decade. Um, right now, we're in a period where gerrymandering has reached new heights. And if you look at some of the gerrymanders from the previous decade, you can see there are some pretty strange shapes that have been drawn in order to gain advantage, either a, a racial advantage or a partisan advantage. And the weird thing about this gallery here is that of these seven districts that are drawn, only one of them has a water border, the Ohio 9th District. All the other districts here are inland, which means that all the boundaries you see here are drawn by human hands, sometimes following a river or something like that, but generally speaking, basically following political boundaries. And what is being done in each of these cases is taking um, either taking your opponents and packing them into as few districts as possible so they only get one district, or worse yet, dividing them completely so that they get no power, and then your side gets a bare majority, say like 55%, just enough votes to win control. And by doing so, it's possible to make individual votes more or less without value and to basically build a structural advantage where the outcome is politicians choosing their voters rather than voters choosing their elected officials. Now, this is a uniquely American problem. Uh, this is a survey now of uh, political experts asking them, uh, is gerrymandering a problem in such and such a country? So for instance, if you look at Israel, in Israel, gerrymandering is not a problem at all because they have proportional representation through the Knesset where, uh, where all parties are represented proportionally. But if you look here, gerrymandering is a unique problem in the United States. It were the worst of any country surveyed. And so in this respect, we've got a special problem. So what I want to do is talk um, in the remaining time mainly about this problem, not because it's the only problem in our democracy, but it's because it's the problem that we're working on right now. And we have a few different ways that we're working on it. And I want to mention those and then broaden out the conversation uh, a little bit to other ways that data can, uh, can do good. Uh, but I wanted to just flag this as my topic for the next few minutes, and then we can have a general discussion. So as I said, this is a team we've got going here. Uh, we are not all at Princeton. We're also at other places. Uh, we formed, for instance, a partnership with a, a person named John Opdyke and his organization, Open Primaries, works to, um, up here in the upper right, uh, John Opdyke's organization works to open the primary process so that anybody can vote in a primary, and so, which makes the nominations no longer just the province of, uh, of the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, we have a pretty large team of people here um, uh, working on data and technology up in the upper left, Hannah, Indranil, Amanda, and Ari. Uh, work on data analytics to uh, create things like scorecards, report cards to gauge the fairness of a, of a plan. We've got this whole team in the middle row here, which is uh, all Princeton undergraduates or recent graduates. And these Princeton students are uh, working on creating a software tool to help communities stand up for themselves and speak up for themselves in the redistricting process. And then in the lower left, we have a legal team uh, of lawyers and one pre-law student uh, the, uh, and one political science professor, uh, Jonathan Servas, uh, he actually is an academic at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, and we use the law to try to understand redistricting principles and to apply them using the technologies that I've talked about. So it's a pretty large team, pretty diverse team, uh, and I, um, I'll hope to uh, talk about some of their work, and then we can get into Q&A and drill into some of it a little bit more. Uh, 
So at the Electoral Innovation Lab, we work in uh, several different domains. Uh, our general game is to uh, work on structural reforms that can make uh, democracy stronger. Those structural reforms can be drawing fairer districts. They can also be reforming voting rules. For instance, ranked choice voting is something that's become very hot in the last year or so, uh, year or, or three. Uh, and so we work on things like structural reforms. Uh, in a complex society like the United States, we work on marginalized communities and communities of interest. Broadly speaking, I would say that we work on data for good through all our projects. And all the projects on the left are projects that we work on, whether it be the Electoral Innovation Lab, which is the umbrella for all of it, uh, the Princeton Gerrymandering Project, which is one of our major foci right now, Representable, the undergraduate project, and other projects that are uh, coming up in the future and that, that I've long had an interest in, such as the Princeton Election Consortium. Our general theory of change in the case of redistricting is that redistricting is a, typically a closed door process with unshared data that remains private, used using proprietary software, drawing lines behind closed doors, leading to gerrymandering. Our theory is that if we take public data and we create open tools for redistricting, for evaluating plans, uh, and for, uh, for taking public input, we can take all the, that open data put it through open tools, and then provide transparency, radical transparency that's useful for reformers, for journalists, and for litigators. And the idea is that by doing so, we can have a more open process. Here's one project that we're working on right now that's actually pretty big in the news. If you do a Google News search on um, Princeton Gerrymandering Project, you are likely to come up with this. We've developed a way to take all the analytics that we do and turn it into a representational fairness report card where people on the ground in states like Virginia or North Carolina or New Mexico or here in New Jersey will take a draft map that's offered by a governmental entity like a legislature or a planning commission, a redistricting commission. And they take that and they, they take that map. And if it's not digitized already, then they digitize it for us, put it into a format that we can feed into our scoring engine. And Indranil, Hannah and Amanda and Ari, who's not shown in this uh, slide here, and Ari, um, take that and they put it into an engine that calculates a bunch of things like uh, how compact are the shapes of the districts, uh, how squiggly are the boundaries, those are geographic features, how much are counties split. Partisan fairness, compared with a million random simulations, how fair are these maps to the two major parties? In this case, this particular plan we're looking at here is pretty fair and treats the two parties uh, in proportion to their strength in the uh, 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 in voting and, and has actually a reasonable number of competitive races and so partisan fairness. And we'll also score the maps on minority composition, which is not shown here, but the idea is to also understand whether this map does a decent job of scoring minority community or empowering minority communities. And that last one is challenging because the entire American structure of democracy is built upon single member districts. And so it's actually very hard to get away from that. And so given that we live with single member districts, can we come up with a plan that at least does some job of representing specific minority communities, whether it be uh, black communities, Hispanic communities, Asian or other communities. So this is a pretty tough uh, um, uh, challenge. Uh, just one such example is here, uh, here in New Jersey, uh, a challenge comes from representing Asian American communities. Um, Asian American communities are the fastest growing communities in New Jersey, uh, matched uh, only, the only community that comes close is Latino communities. Uh, and you can see here mapped on the left by county and on the right by uh, state legislative district, you can see that there's a pattern of growth that's in urban areas, that's in the north and central parts of the state. And the question is, how can we form uh, representational entities, districts that do a good job of, of empowering these communities as well as all the other communities of the state? And so one of the technological challenges that we face is finding ways to draw maps that do a good job of representing the diversity of a state like New Jersey, which is one of the most diverse states in the country. And that requires map drawing. And so not only their scoring, which I showed you in the previous slide, the drawing of maps is another thing that we get very interested in. And we in fact have had things like a mapping contest where uh, we took the winners of the mapping contest and we formed a thing that we called the map core where it's a core of uh, people who are good at drawing maps, who enjoy drawing them, and who can help in coming up with maps that can then be contributed to planning commissions to help them see how they could do better. Now, I just wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about the Representable Project. Uh, Representable is a project that started as a computer science uh, project in a class called COAST 333, which is a project lab, where students and I started getting to the topic of, well, how could we use software to help gain 
better representation. And we got the idea of creating uh, a technology platform for communities to report their own location and interests to then feed the redistricting process because over half of states in the United States have legal requirements to respect and uphold communities of interest during redistricting. And we had, we've had some really great visitors, um, former Congressman and presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke came to visit us and Beto um, got very interested in representable as a way to, um, uh, to build fair representation. Now I should say that knowing where communities are is very important for fairness. I'm just gonna give you a puzzle to look at and let me just sh show this to you real quick. Um, if you take the same community, I, these are two dot patterns that are exactly the same on the left and right. And so if you take the same pattern of people, you could draw a gerrymander if you want to, you feel, feel free to take a screenshot of this right now. If you take a screenshot of this, you can draw lines on it uh, at your leisure. And the, the challenge I pose to you is, can you take this and draw six districts that either give the maximum advantage to the greens or draw six districts that give maximum advantage to the purples. And if you look at this, I'm just in the interest of time, I'm just gonna show you the best answer that I've come up with. And in this case, if the greens are in charge, then they can actually take all the purples and pack them into one central district and get themselves five districts. If the purples are in charge, they can cut the, uh, the uh, they can share out their own strength among those uh, rural districts, and they can create a plan that has four districts for their side. So if you can go from five districts on one side to four districts for the other side, all by where you draw the lines, I think it's safe to say that line draws have a lot of power compared with the voters themselves. And so our goal generally is to find ways to make this process neutral and fair to avoid having outcomes that are extreme in one direction or the other. And I should say that one difficulty is to do all this within the constraints of what is possible and allowed under the law. And one strong constraint is doing what's possible because of course one can come up with better systems just by sitting around and talking, but uh, we have to work with the laws that we have and with the processes that we have. So here's one idea that we're currently working on. Um, this is a, an article that's gonna come out in a legal journal, a law journal pretty soon. It's coming out in the Stanford Journal of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. And Sandra Chen, an undergraduate, and I worked with a number of scholars, uh, sorry, Sandra and Kyle are both undergraduates, uh, worked with a number of scholars to come up with an idea of finding ways to define communities of interest and also to quantify them. So to come up with mathematical ways to define a quality of interest so that this map that's divided three ways, 33, 33, 34, is a very split community whereas this map on the right is not very split. And so we developed ways of mathematically defining splits. And I encourage you to look up this, uh, this, uh, this article, which is, as I said, in the Stanford Journal of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, where we came up with a rigorous standard for, for fair districting. And if you look in Google Scholar, you can look up that article. So this is just an example of ways in which we're combining law, in this case, and math, to come up with better ways to, to represent communities fairly. So, um, so I encourage you to look up some of these things. Uh, my slides are actually a little bit out of order and I sense myself running out of time. Uh, I've already mentioned representable. Uh, this is the representable team and I encourage you to look up representable.org. Uh, uh, we're really quite proud of this project. It's in full swing. And now we're facing, facing intensive deadline pressure to not only collect those representable, those uh, communities in representable.org, but to actually offer them to redistricting commissions in the next few months where redistricting is happening now in real time. And any communities that are gathered now need to be provided without delay to the people drawing the lines. And so we have software to, uh, to answer questions about a community. Uh, we have uh, mapping software that allows uh, these things to be drawn in a, in a map box based front end. We have a way, ways to visualize and share that information and then to upload it to commissions. Um, we have outreach currently that's going uh, in, uh, in dozens of states around the country uh, we have uh, community mapping drives. We have, uh, this slide is actually obsolete. We have now over a thousand communities drawn. Uh, we've identified target states for maximum redistricting impact. And we've, uh, and people around the country have drawn hundreds of thousands of communities. And so this is an example of a project that's really taken off and is a combination of technology and, uh, and voter power. And we're hoping to do things to deploy this around the country in the states that are indicated in the map here. To, uh, to make an, a real impact on the redistricting process that's happening now and in the coming year. So why don't I go ahead and let's stop the share and I've talked for too long. I'll pause there and let's, I uh, hope to have a good discussion.
Um, thank you so much for that information, Professor Wang. It was helpful to hear the work that you're doing with the electoral lab, and then also the efforts that go beyond kind of the reach of that initiative in particular. We do have a few questions that have come in that I'd like to pose to you to hear your thoughts about if you wouldn't mind. Um, first of which is, could you talk a little bit about how conducting the census during the pandemic may have had an impact on gerrymandering moving forward? I would say that the census was a challenge to conduct because of the difficulty in reaching some populations and the ease of reaching other populations. And so when people stay at home, they're easy to reach. But when people have to work or when the census takers themselves are limited in how they can go to door to door, that of course makes responses more difficult. Um, the impact of, of, of survey conditions on the census was really variable by state. And I would say in most states, the impact was surprisingly small. The count appeared to have gone off without a hitch. Uh, the Census Bureau has ways of imputing what happens if they have an apartment block and somebody's not at home. They use information from neighboring apartments, for example, to, uh, to take their best guess as to how many people are there. And I would say in a state like New Jersey or a state like New York, where the, where the state put a lot of effort into outreach and funding uh, canvassing efforts, the census went surprisingly well. But there were states when the census didn't go so well, uh, where there was some undercounting that occurred. And that typically happened in states where there was not local effort by the state government to, uh, to count people. And specifically, there were undercounts in Texas, Florida, and Arizona. Those are all states with uh, significant Hispanic communities. And there were undercounts that occurred there. And as far as we can tell, it is likely that those states lost congressional representation because they undercounted those Hispanic communities. And furthermore, those undercounts may have been adverse for the voting rights of those communities. And so I'd say there's some pretty focal um, um, injury that's been done uh, in certain cases, uh, but I would say it was a focal injury as opposed to a global injury, which I think is a little bit of a blessing. But what it means is that we, we as a community need to focus on those states and other places where they may, there may have been an undercount. Thank you for sharing those insights. We do have a few other questions that have come in, but I also want to remind the audience that if they have questions, they can add them to the Q&A function or to the chat function of Zoom, and we'll make sure to respond, those, respond to those as quickly as possible. Another question that came in is, how did or do you determine the metrics for the fairness report cards? Is there disagreement about what they should be or that isn't political? Well, this is a good question. You know, redistricting is a pretty, um, fraught affair. And generally, any party that's involved will usually accuse the other side of being partisan. The goal of the report card is to come up with objective measures arranged in advance that we can automate, where we can say, look, these are the values we put into the report card and then score it. Um, I certainly agree that one has to think about what values go into that report card, but we have set up the whole thing to be automated. And I'll just give you an example of some of the principles. Uh, a traditional principle is that districts should be compact and not split up existing political divisions too much. And one can quantify that by counting how many times the county is, the county lines, uh, sorry, how many times counties are split. One can quantify that by saying how irregular is a county bound, uh, as a district boundary. And so there are ways to quantify that. So if the value is to maintain compactness, then there are ways to quantify it. Another value would be that there should be a sense of fair play, that the major parties should have equal uh, similar opportunities to uh, to elect members to their liking. These are this is a very well trodden ground academically speaking, and there are clear metrics for it. We can argue about whether the two parties should have uh, similar opportunities. Um, I, these days, democracy is in a situation where uh, where there are strong supporters of one party, the Republican Party, that is not entirely committed to the idea that people should be represented um, in uh, in similar measure. That's a thing that's happening right now. So, uh, so that's another way. Um, and then there are questions that are like on the edge of representational fairness. What should we do to represent uh, minority groups or racial groups? Um, and that's currently a bone of contention because the Voting Rights Act um, is in the process of being reinterpreted by federal courts. Um, Section five is something that went away in a decision called Shelby County. Section two may change in the near future given the change in the federal courts. And I would say um, it is an open question how uh, to represent uh, racial minorities in the United States. Um, should a, a minority that is present, let's say at 15, 20% of the population, uh, if they 
always lose elections because they are 15, 20% of the population, are they out of luck? Or should there be efforts made to make sure that they're represented fairly? Uh, legal doctrine suggests that there are legal protections for those communities. Uh, and what we've done is we've come up with ways to visualize those and score them. Um, so I, I don't know, I feel very comfortable with the, uh, with the rigor and intellectual honesty of our report card and it's, we're deploying it around the country. Um, at some level, having set a grading curve, we've tried to set it up in a way that we can't really change it once it's out there. Um, if we make a mistake, we may adjust it, but broadly speaking, we have a grading curve. So, um, you know, um, if you're a student, you don't always be, like being graded by your teacher, but um, that doesn't change the fact that your teacher has a job to do. Thank you for sharing your thoughts there. Um, another question that came in that might be impactful for students is, how can people living outside of state slash districts with poor gerrymandering grades help this problem? Does advocacy have to occur within a state or district to have an impact? The most effective advocacy, advocacy right now comes from local communities and local residents because they are the ones who can speak up for themselves. Um, right now, we are very engaged with redistricting in places like North Carolina, Virginia, and so on. I think one has to be careful about these things because I think the best advocates for any local reform are people within that community. Um, there may be exceptions to that. For instance, if you're part of a racial community, then you would perhaps have, have some claim to fellowship with the people in a state. Uh, I'll give you an example. Right now we're engaged in redistricting in Virginia and we have a report card deployed that you can look up at gerrymander.princeton.edu. Um, we came up with those report cards and we started issuing them and local people in Virginia started saying things like, well, why should we listen to these liberal academics in New Jersey and their thoughts about redistricting fairness and you know they've got a point because in fact it is locals who should have the most say. That having been said, we're pretty good at what we do, and I certainly have no apology to anybody for the fact that we've developed some excellent quantitative tools. Um, I would like to think that some of those people in Virginia were surprised when we said, actually, we've looked at the state senate and, and uh, uh, I think it was the state house maps, and we discovered that the best plan offered was a Republican one, and we said so because the quantitative metrics pointed in that direction. And so, you know, uh, I think that these metrics have the advantage of pointing towards um, a Republican drawn plan or a Democratic drawn plan or a community drawn plan as being best. Um, and it's just, you know, we let the data lead us where it goes. Um, I think that there are ways for you to help if you join up with a national organization, whether it be Fair Vote or Common Cause or the League of Women Voters, those national organizations can often be of use. Um, you know, we are such an organization at this point. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, a lot of this has to happen locally. Thank you for sharing that perspective and for drawing in thoughts that were received by commentators outside of the state to reflect kind of your interaction with others that are using the tools that you're putting out there. So thank you, Dr. Lang. Um, we did receive a question from the Facebook live stream that says, the Indiana legislator just this month redrew our nearly competitive district to make it overwhelmingly Republican. We now have no competitive districts in Indiana, which will solidify Republican control. Is there a function of the project website to reflect change? Our site is changing every day. So we score these plans as they come out. We put those scores up. Um, and Indiana is not really a focus for us right now because Indiana has single party control over redistricting. And as far as I'm aware, there is no legal route to changing that. So, um, I would say that the Indiana gerrymander is a situation where uh, I would characterize, um, you know, my other discipline is neuroscience. And it used to be that in neurology, there were not good treatments for disorders. And what neurologists used to joke was, we don't treat diseases, we admire them. And, um, and I would say that uh, by which they mean we can diagnose it, but we can't really, there are many that we can't do anything about. I would characterize the Indiana congressional map as something that one can admire for its artistry. Thank you for sharing that. And again, to remind folks that you know, data and policy are living beings. And so as your site evolves, as, as information becomes available, individuals should check back regularly, not only just with the state of Indiana, but others. There is one 
teeny tiny air conditioning duct that you can go down and shoot up the Death Star, which is the, um, the For the People Act, which is currently under consideration in Congress, might be a way to impose national standards on, uh, on redistricting. Um, that's a pretty tough row, at, row to hoe at the moment. Uh, it could work, uh, but it is very challenging. So I would say to the extent that one can address that, one way to address it would be the, through the For the People Act. So that is another question that we did receive, Professor Wang, is how can the HR1 help with gerrymandering at large? So I know you talked a little bit about Indiana there, but could you share overall impressions of what HR1 could do? Yeah, it's gotten a new number now. It's like 3453 or something horrible like that. But uh, let's see. So, you know, there are certain kinds of voting rights that we get really agitated about that really get a lot of press. Uh, and, and there's nothing uh, unimportant about those. Those are very important things like access to voting or voter ID laws and so on. Uh, but I should also say that the effects of many of those regressive laws are surprisingly small. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't fight them, but those turn out to be relatively small effects. Redistricting has huge effects and all the voting in the world is of no use if lines are drawn to, be, to, un, to disfavor you as we just heard about in Indiana. HR1 and its successors contain protections against partisan gerrymandering. And these are among the more obscure provisions of that bill because they're a little technical, but they actually are very important protections. They make a rebuttable presumption of gerrymandering in federal law, which means that lawsuits can be brought in the case of a partisan gerrymander. And so the, the anti-gerrymandering provisions in HR1 and its, its successors are extremely important. And it's been really encouraging to see Senators Klobuchar, Manchin, and others preserve those in the bill. And so if that bill goes anywhere, which you know it might, um, I think that those are actually pretty important protections that we could look forward to having in the future. Thank you for that response. I know we have time for about two more questions. Uh, the first of which is you reflected a little bit on this within North Carolina, but the individual is asking if you can talk a little bit more about the latest news out of North Carolina. And what does it mean for the maps to be thrown out if new ones were required to be redrawn? Let's see. So I actually have not watched today's news in North Carolina. So the person could press illuminate that a little bit more. We have been observing North Carolina redistricting pretty closely. It's a nominally open process where the legislators are going to public terminals and drawing those maps. Uh, we've got hordes of nerds in North Carolina downloading those, screenshotting them, and loading them into Dave's re redistricting app and, and turning them into shape files so that we can score them. And we're delighted at the contacts that we have in North Carolina, and we thank those people. Um, the challenge right now is that they do appear to be heading towards drawing a congressional gerrymander. Uh, I certainly wouldn't rule it out. And there was at least one map that I saw that uh, this was done by a hobbyist that showed that it's at least technically possible to draw, I think, a, an 11-3 map or a 12-2 map, which was just incredible in a 50-50 state. Um, so there is some hope of addressing that in state Supreme Court, uh, and that is the only way to do it at the moment because there are no federal standards for partisan gerrymandering unless something like HR1 passes. And so I think um, public attention right now is critical in creating a trail of evidence that may eventually lead to consideration in court. And you know, there is a possibility that enough public outcry during the process may restrain the offense somewhat, which would be um, much better than an unrestrained offense. So, uh, so we are watching it carefully. We've, we're, we've been starting to issue report cards in that case. Uh, we're extremely interested in what's happening in North Carolina. Thank you for sharing. And then lastly, a question for the, for the entire group here is, where do you see the role or impact that students can have when it comes to your efforts of the Electoral Innovation Lab or gerrymandering at large to support their, their communities and their peers? Oh, we've had um, excellent experiences working with, um, with undergraduate students uh, and also with graduate students. Um, so ways in which students have helped are uh, computer scientists have, and others, uh, graphic artists and designers and, and humanists have worked together to build a representable project. And so representable is one way that students can get involved to either develop the software or at this point, honestly, to draw the communities and to, and to publicize them state by state. So representable is one project. Another project we have is students to either um, 
draw maps or to offer commentary to do analysis. And so uh, people who are very quantitatively minded can help with that. Uh, we've had graduate students get involved with uh, doing these simulations. I think I mentioned uh, that we have a, a baseline for judging fairness of having a computer simulation draw a million possible maps. We have a group called um, called Ensemble Club. Ensemble mapping is, a, is the computer method that, that uh, and so you can get in touch with us and be involved in that. And then finally, uh, I didn't really talk about it too much, but voting rules were uh, things like ranked choice voting and approval voting and other voting methods. Uh, we're starting to do a deep dive into that. And, and some of that involves legal research. And so people who are uh, legally minded can also play a role. Uh, broadly speaking, I'd say that we have a lot of roles that are possible. Uh, we're, uh, for anyone who's a freshman, we have a freshman seminar coming up on voting rules that we're, that we're gonna be teaching in the spring uh, in collaboration with American Studies. And so that freshman seminar may be another way uh, to, uh, to make contact with us. So, you know, lots of ways to do it. Um, I would encourage people to browse through our site, not only gerrymander.princeton.edu, but also democracy.princeton.edu. If you take a look at that, you, you can see, uh, get a sense for all the things that we're doing. Thank you so much for sharing about how individuals can be involved and then a kind of large brushstroke of the work that you've been doing. A huge thank you to you, Professor Wang, as well as to the Electoral Innovations Lab at Princeton and then to the Princeton Vote 100 team as well for taking part in today's conversation. We do thank you for the work that you do and for sharing it with all of us today and with others abroad. So thank you again. For those taking part in the program, know that we'll share a recap of today's conversation as well as the resources that were provided throughout the conversation, but do hope that you'll reach out and that you'll engage as Professor Wang had mentioned in the multitude of opportunities that are available to you. But with that, we thank you all for being with us and we look forward to connecting next time. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you.